So good morning, everybody. Um, I am here with um, somewhat of a new friend, a friend of a friend mm -hmm. through our hero, um, Andrea Zimmerman from the University of Virginia's continuing um, medical education. Um, Catherine Kuvian, welcome. I'm so glad. This is your second year. Last year, you were part of um, the United States Bipartisan Cancer Prevention Congressional Caucus, huge mouthful. And you were incredibly powerful. And that was um, really the first time I had heard your story mm. um, from you, from you directly. And I was so moved and moved by you and your spirit, moved by your energy, um, moved by your ability to self-advocate, which you do an incredible job of and are modeled to so many and so helpful to so many. Okay. Um, so here we are. And I want you to share your story with our audience and with those who are participating and um, taking this program for medical credits. So continuing medical credits, CMEs. Um, welcome. Thank you so much, Bill. Um, it's really an honor to be here. I don't feel like I'm a good advocate for myself. Um, I'm a great advocate for other people. Um, so I'm going to take my own words to heart. Uh, and encourage myself um, to stand up for the care that I need even more. Um, I was diagnosed with stage two breast cancer. Um, we're coming up on my 10 year anniversary actually. Um, and I was 31 years old at the time. And my family really hadn't had any history of cancer whatsoever. Um, we didn't know, but it turned out that, that we actually carry the BRCA2 genetic mutation which of course makes you higher risk um, for breast and ovarian cancer. Um, so I did all the treatments they recommended. Um, actually, I, I did more than was recommended um, even because of my BRCA mutation. I chose to get um, a bilateral double mastectomy. Um, I agreed to go through chemo, even though I did not want to do that. I was really worried about losing my hair, which is so vain. Um, but I did, I did that. I went on other preventative drugs um, to keep my cancer from coming back. Um, I got seen regularly at my doctor's office. Um, but unfortunately, um, three and a half years later, I was diagnosed um, with stage four breast cancer. Um, they found that the cancer had spread into my spine. Um, and now my condition was terminal. Um, that was really, really difficult news. Um, at the time I thought I wouldn't live to see my 40th birthday. And I've always been a person who was really interested in health and wellness. Um, I became a vegetarian when I was like 11 years old. Um, I've been so interested in nutrition, um, and how to stay healthy, um, keep fit. I even went vegan um, with Andrea um, at some point um, in solidarity with her. Um, so I really didn't feel like I had these extra risk factors or things that would have caused me to um, progress into stage four. Um, I lived for about three years, um, stage four, um, preparing myself um, for the fact that I would probably be the, the first one in my family to pass away. Um, and I thought that there was some small mercy in that because at least I wouldn't have to see any of my family members pass away. Um, but unfortunately, um, my dad ended up um, finding out that he has had a mesothelioma. Um, and within six weeks of his diagnosis, he passed away. Um, Obviously, it's really hard to lose a parent, especially so quick um, and from a, such a terrible disease. Um, but to have to watch him die of cancer and then know that I'm going to have to die from cancer um, was just all the more difficult. Um, and earlier this year, uh, well, actually, 2020, um, I found out that the treatment that had been working for me um, for five years to keep me stable um, 
was no longer working for me and I had to switch to a new treatment regime. Um, so I'm now on a clinical trial. Um, so far that's going well, but a lot of difficulties um, that I face are not knowing who to ask, not knowing what symptoms are concerning, um, seeing my oncologist so often, but not getting a response from him on things that he feels are outside of the cancer realm. Um, most recently I've been struggling with new headaches um, and they went ahead and did an MRI scan and they've been able to rule out cancer, which is excellent. Um, but after they ruled out cancer, they were just kind of like, okay, it's not cancer. And I don't know what to try next. Um, so one thing that I wanted um, to bring to light as a need that I definitely see from a patient perspective is the need for care coordination. Um, physician maybe that's in charge of everything or a team of physicians that communicates with each other. Um, I feel like I have all these little silos of care and I'm supposed to be the thread that connects everything. Um, thankfully, I have a background working um, as an IT person in healthcare, so I'm a little more well-versed than some other people, um, but I have to do tons of research on my own and try to figure out the path that I want to go forward. Um, I have to beat back all the people who say, I heard about this moon dust and it's really great and it's been curing cancer um, and do my own research and find out if that's even true or... <laughs> um, and not even being able to ask my oncologist really because there are whole avenues of um, treatments that they don't really study because they're not medical treatments. They might be nutrition or supplements or something, some other lifestyle treatment. Um, so yeah, I would say that's the area I struggle with the most um, and where I think we maybe need the most um, progress um, from a patient perspective. You though, however, in knowing more about your story have been able to really been able to sort out the fake news and sort out, you know, because there is so much, you know, it's, it is really um, remarkable what you've been able to navigate in my mind. Hmm. I do want to say, um, you know, just as an outsider, how impressed I am with your own self care, the way you've been able to keep yourself moving and, and taking care of yourself nutritionally and doing some of those things that not only keep you functioning better during the day, but keep you healthier longer. And I think that is uh, really impressive. Oh. And we know from this last journey that um, you were really living with cancer, mm -hmm. right? And that yeah, but not just like living with cancer, you were doing yeah. incredible things to take care of yourself. And you look amazingly healthy. You look so good. And I, I hope those headaches, um, you know, back away. I hope mm -hmm. they can get some answers on that. Yeah. But um, is there anything that you would like to share with those listening and with a cancer diagnosis, how they might what was your best go-to like in navigating the systems? And now you have shared that you have a background in IT in the, in the area of healthcare. Um, but can you share with um, everyday people like myself, what your next steps were upon hearing that diagnosis? What did you do on your own to help yourself? Yeah. Well, of course, immediately I went to Dr. Google, as we all like to do. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where I found um, some of the scary statistics um, of life expectancy mm -hmm. after a diagnosis. Um, but I think one of the most helpful things that I've used to navigate it has actually been a Facebook group uh, full of other women with similar diagnoses. And being able to ask them, you know, what have you tried? what has worked for you, what hasn't worked for you. Mm -hmm. um, what did your doctor say about this? Or I have this pain and should I be concerned? Or is that a common side effect? Um, all these kinds of things where you 
maybe they're small enough that you don't even want to like talk to your doctor about it, but you have a concern or maybe it's something you feel embarrassed to bring up or um, sometimes I'm afraid that my oncologist is going to think I'm a hypochondriac because you worry about every little ache and pain. Um, and so that's a great place. The Facebook group um, is a great place to go to be able to share concerns and get some feedback from other people. Um, so I tend to crowdsource, I guess I would say a lot of my information um, as well as I have a couple of um, more integrative um, physicians. I like to listen to podcasts that they share. Um, there's a new, relatively new field of integrative oncology. Um, and so Charlotte, um, I know I used to speak and share my cancer story. And I was able to speak with a physician from Charlotte who was the head of their integrative oncology mm -hmm. program. So thankfully I had access to her and I would ask her, you know, what's new, what do I need to be thinking about? Um, mm -hmm. And so she would give me great recommendations. Um, but the first three years, I would say of my stage four diagnosis, um, I did that, I crowd surfed, um, crowdsourced and it seemed like people were saying I was vegan and I ran marathons and I had progression and other people were saying like, I eat whatever I want. I, my life is going to be short. I want to enjoy it. So I kind of took the approach like, well, you know, I think I'll try to make some good choices, but it doesn't really seem to matter. I felt fatalistic. Um, and then I really got inspired probably around year four that you know what? I, I feel like I'm not doing enough. Um, I, I just, I want to take back control and make some changes. Um, I learned about reducing inflammation. Um, I think that was also maybe from an audiobook that I got from my library. Um, my doctor, my oncologist, I think he kind of just chuckles at me um, because they don't really um, train in nutrition. Um, medical um, students don't train in nutrition. Um, so I, I honestly, I don't share a lot with my oncologist um, about what I do as far as food and supplements because he doesn't really have any additional information for me, which I think is really unfortunate. Um, I would love to be able to have um, my oncologist perspective on these different things, um, but he just doesn't. So um, I find my own podcast. I try to go with uh, medical professionals um, who do have degrees, but have then gone on to do additional um, training in some of the mm -hmm. alternative medicine or integrative um, medicine. Um, so I would start there. Of course, you can always go to American Cancer Society or um, cancer.org um, and you'll find probably the same stuff that your oncologist will tell you. Um, but I would just encourage anyone to look up integrative oncology and mm -hmm. find out the kinds of things that they recommend. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you, you talk about, I think a common fear for a lot of patients is, oh, my doctor thinks I'm a hypochondriac. And we know it really doesn't matter what your doctor thinks on that, right? You need to be telling your doctor, sharing your stories and your concerns. And for God's sakes, you have real concerns. This is not, you know, um, some tale you've woven. You have real concerns. You have been you know, head on in dealing with this for a decade. Mm -hmm. It's really, you know, it's, it's amazing what you have done. Um, obviously, you know, you are checking in with your physicians, you are sharing yes. your story, and they're aware of what you're doing, which is, mm -hmm. I think it's key, if people are going to be um, um, surfing the web and may not know how to qualify like see you know how to document resources you know you understand that not everybody does so i yes. think in those cases those stories are important to share with your physician yes. just like you have um because you want to make sure you're not doing anything to endanger yourself yes, um, and, and yet a lot of doctors you know the role of medicine has been changing and i'd like to think we 
have had a role in that because mm -hmm. what we're finding now is that as the more we do this workshop, there are more physicians that are learning to become better advocates for their patients and for mm -hmm. their communities, and they're sharing their information. And I always say to them, listen, I'm a C student. You're the, the guy or woman <laughs> with you know, the medical degree or the advanced science degree. So it really doesn't matter what I think. I may mm -hmm. have the best intentions, but I'm not your go-to. Mm -hmm. So we do need to be guided by this evidence-based science that's out there. And we Absolutely. need our healthcare providers helping to not only guide us as individuals and guide our families and communities because they're the ones with the information. And yes, you are so correct on matters of nutrition, um, but because that isn't part of their training doesn't mean that they're not interested and that we shouldn't include them. Yes. Because now more and more physicians are reaching out in areas of, um, you know, wanting to know more, wanting to understand more, really understand the benefits. And there are still some that, you know, are like, oh, it doesn't matter, whatever you want, blah, blah, blah. But I know in my own case, um, you know, I'm 61 years old, that in the last four or five years, um, my life has changed by really focusing on nutrition and movement. And my life was very different in my 50s um, than it was in my 60s, and even diff more different in my 40s, you know. So it's really, you know, these um, actions that we take to take care of ourselves are not convenient. It's not like reaching for a bag of Fritos. It is, it takes work. And, you know, if you want to feel better, be healthier, you know, you're going to have to pay attention to some of these things. And I, you know, we know that the way you take care of yourself does help you feel better mm -hmm. and that you have been in charge of that, mm -hmm. which is powerful to me. Mm -hmm. um, can you share to, with me like your support team that you have, have um, uh, dealt with at your doctor's office, any nurses or any uh, people at the treatment centers or people that you would like to point to and what specifically about them makes you feel better? Mm -hmm. Well, my oncology team, um, I have my oncologist and I have um, his nurse practitioner. And then also I have a nurse care coordinator. Um, now that position has turned over. So don't have the one I originally started with, um, but they are, were instrumental in answering those initial questions that I had, mm -hmm. um, side effects, um, what things I could take with other things as far as um, the other medications that I was on. Mm -hmm. um, also, I have a pharmacist through my um, insurance company um, that I have, I think it's quarterly phone calls with, um, and, and that is a great resource, especially for asking about other medications that I might want to be adding for different health concerns. Um, they are often pretty knowledgeable about right. supplements as well. Um, so that's an excellent resource. Um, and most recently, actually, the pharmacist at the cancer center has offered to help me navigate the copay system for one of my injectable drugs um, that's been really difficult um, to deal with. So yes, I'm very thankful for my team. They're so encouraging. Um, they definitely listen to my concerns. Um, like sometimes I think they chuckle at me, um, but I definitely, I, I didn't want to give the impression that I hide anything from them. Um, and I'm extremely cautious as to the things that mm -hmm. I try on my own. It's typically just some vitamins. Um, and I, I, there's a website, I think it might be on Memorial Sloan Kettering's website, um, but you can look up all kinds of supplements and compare them to the drugs that you're on and it'll tell you if it's contraindicated. That's a great tool. Yeah. It's so good. So uh, mm -hmm. I've used that a lot. Um, but yes, Google, even you'll, at least in, for me, it was pretty obvious which ones, which types of things might have concerns. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll pretty quickly see in the search results that there's questions about don't use it with this. It, it's pretty easy, um, you know, for you because you, this is what you've been doing. True. Right? Yes. So the brand new person that isn't, um, you know, online a whole lot, although it's hard to imagine with COVID. Um, but there are people that are still not online a lot, mm -hmm. and they are seeking, you know, whatever comes up first in the search engines, not necessarily because um, it's an issue of knowledge or science or evidence, but because they've paid for the search engine placement, or they've yeah. paid for, you know, it's, it has something 
other than do with your health or the relevance of it. So I think really, um, you know, as you have done vetting some of these resources, we know not all supplements are, are, you know, you know, the way to roll. Mm -hmm. Um, We know that um, the FDA is not done a lot with a lot of them. So it, it, you know, there are things that we have to be careful of, check with our doctors, check with our teams. I want to make sure too that, and I know it's because I do it myself for my own doctors. You're like, oh, I probably sound like a jerk or I probably sound like, but you know what? That's their job. Their mm-hmm. job is to listen yep. to you and not to put uh, a spin on whether you sound like a jerk or not. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I find that the good, the good docs are the ones that say, you know what? I really don't know, but we need to follow up and we need to go to these places. So it's important to, to have that kind of honest relationship, mm-hmm. which it sounds like you have, mm-hmm. where people can say, gosh, I just don't know. And these are places that you can go. The great thing about your squad is that they're all kind of cross checking each other and you've mm-hmm. really got a team with different skills and uh, under the umbrella of your oncologist, which is, mm-hmm. is awesome. Mm-hmm. So, um, are there things that you do um, that keep your attitude so good? Like your attitude is incredible. Mm. Uh, um, is, it, is it spiritual? Is it prayer? Is it exercise? Tell us what keeps you going. Definitely um, spiritual. Um, mm-hmm. I, I'm a naturally positive person, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, but even right. like, Today, um, I'm wearing a necklace that says hope um, because sometimes you just have to preach those messages to yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, I have bracelets that say, you know, be brave or take courage or different things that I'll wear when I go for treatments or scans. Um, So just that that constant reminder that there is hope. um, I believe that there's going to be a continued life for me when I cease living um, here on earth. And so that gives me a lot of hope. Um, Of course, some days when you feel like you're only just facing a future of pain, um, it can feel really hard to hope. Um, But I try to remind myself that, okay, you feel this way today, but you might not feel that way tomorrow. Like look back in the past or this afternoon. Right. Um, maybe you can do like one thing to get your mind off of it or um, go for a walk or during the pandemic, they've offered a lot of virtual exercise classes, mm-hmm. which has been amazing for me because it takes a lot of energy to get out of the house and get down to a gym or, um, and so I wasn't really good about doing that. But when it comes to my house, um, it, it's been amazing. I felt so much better doing um, some Pilates and yoga Mm-hmm. Um, so some gentle movement walks, um, spending time in nature, um, but definitely focusing on, um, my faith, um, prayer, trying to help others has been a big part of what makes me feel better. And you are helping so many and you helped so many last year because okay. they see that you're leading a quality of life that seems to be, you know, while worrisome, you seem, you appear, um, by eye and sound, <laughs> to be really um, in charge of your destiny. Mm. You know, you're a woman at the wheel. You're uh, definitely, you know, um, making so much happen every time I see you either online or in person or, you know, even on the social media platforms, you're, mm. you're always smiling. And I know mm. that provides so much hope. People underestimate um, the value of hope. They, mm. you know, you'll hear, oh, hope's not a strategy, but it's the first step to a strategy and mm-hmm. it's a critical step. So hope is everything. And, mm-hmm. and um, you, you know, um, there've been, there've been several miracles in your life in the last decade. And mm-hmm. I, and I don't know why or how, but you know, to hear your story and to see you functioning at such a high level is amazing. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure I am sure that the care that you have given yourself has has uh, contributed to um, um, anything worse than what you're dealing with. Mm-hmm. I mean, somehow you've been able to 
be in charge of yourself in a way that is really remarkable. Mm-hmm. And I admire that so much in you. Thank you, Bill. I think your attitude plays such a big role um, in your quality of life. Um, when I, when I used to be able to travel and share my story, I would meet all kinds of women, um, some with early stage breast cancer and some who are metastatic and some of the women, they just, they listed every negative thing in their life, um, as their story. Um, even, even things that were in my mind, relatively small, um, difficulties, they seemed insurmountable to these people based on their attitude. And, I don't know. That's just not how I choose to live my life. Um, I I believe that things are going to work out and things are going to be good. um, And that there's a way to find some happiness and joy in everything, even when the answers, of course, aren't good. Um, Obviously, I'm still looking at a terminal diagnosis, but I don't know when that's going to happen. And there's so many (laughs) wonderful things that can happen in the meantime. Mm -hmm. Um, I have wonderful friends, um, who support me so much. Um, that's huge. Um, and don't be afraid to ask for help. Let -hmm. people know when you need something, or, um, even if you don't feel like you can ask, you know, get a friend to ask or have a friend who will ask you, um, and advocate on your behalf. Um, when I found out that my, um, treatment wasn't working earlier this year, um, I didn't have the energy or the mindset to go researching this clinical trial. Um, my oncologist had recommended it. And so I sent it out to Andrea and her husband, uh, who's also a very intelligent scientist and said, figure out if I should do this. <laughs> Give me your feedback on, on, on if you think this is gonna be beneficial for me. Um, obviously my oncologist's opinion weighed extremely heavily. Um, it was really the only treatment I was considering, but um, instead of having to do all that myself, I Turned delegated it. it. <laughs> yeah, right. And that's another thing. If you're not very tech savvy, um, I think my, my poor mother has had um, a number of different uh, purchases that ended up being scams. Um, find someone who is um, and ask them to do it for you. Right. They typically have a lot of degrees, letters behind their name, just to right. apply to the general public. Yeah. Yeah. Because a lot of us have good ideas that really don't mean much because yeah. we don't have the background to do those things. I, you know, I, I have, I speak to lots of people that have um, had cancer diagnoses that are in your same shoes, you know, yeah. lots of different people. And I do know that the notion of um, preventing cancer some meet with the rub because they're like, obviously, if we could prevent it, I would have prevented it. But it isn't, isn't, that's not what we're really talking about here. And, and I, I, I want to know that, I want you to know that our intention so many years ago, almost now two decades ago, is to lower the risk of suffering. Mm. We know that lowering the risk for suffering also mm. translates to how people care for themselves every day yes. and how they address their life and how they deal with it and what it does to their quality of life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we see that with you. So um, from that place, you know, um, you are really a model for others. And um, we are grateful to have you inside the less cancer circle inside as part of the less cancer family and sharing these stories because we know they are life changing. I hear Mm -hmm from people every day from around the globe. And um, the power of what you are sharing today is so important to people we may never know their names. Mm. And I am grateful to you for that because my intention in serving the public is to lower suffering for all people. Mm. That's Not just cancer. Yes. That's, that's how I choose to serve the world. Mm. And, um, and that's how, what we can do um, with this work for less cancer and, and this programming. So, I love that. I am so grateful for your bravery and sharing your story. Um, we're incredibly thankful to you. Oh, no, thank you so much. It's my honor. All right. You have a good day. Thank Thanks you, so too, much. though. Bye-bye. Bye. Right in my thoughts. Mm-hmm.
Hi, everybody. We're here with Mindy Mesmer. I'm glad to welcome Mindy here today. Um, she has worked with Less Cancer for several years. She has been an Elsie Hillman speaker. She has participated on many levels with the National Cancer Prevention Workshop. Um, for those of you that don't know Mindy, Mindy has uh, really been uh, a, a world changer and has done much to make her community safer around drinking water and forever chemicals that include things like PFAS. But we're here having this conversation with Mindy today because she has a personal experience that we're gonna share today. And um, Mindy, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing your story. Um, you know, here you've been out slugging it out for communities and, and not just communities, but your own community in New Hampshire. And you have gone to the mat fighting to lower risk for cancer. So fast forward, tell me about March. We're well on our way to COVID. Tell, tell me what's been going on since March. Yeah, uh, thanks first, Bill. I mean, the work that you do raising awareness about the need to prevent cancer is so important. And I know that you've made a lot of personal sacrifices and professional sacrifices to do that. And it, the work that you do is just so very important. And as you say, coming from an area where um, I was working actually uh, as an environmental consultant in industry for a long time uh, and identified a, a pediatric cancer cluster in my town. And that sort of um, pushed me into becoming more of an advocate to run for office, to change uh, regulations here in the state of New Hampshire, not just for PFAS, but for other things that cause cancer like arsenic, which is naturally occurring. So very concerned about the high rates of cancer. Uh, speed up to then March 27th of 2020, uh, the state of New Hampshire had just gone into lockdown um, with the COVID pandemic crisis here. And all the hospitals were closed down to visitors. Uh, my husband having come back from a vacation, he never sort of really got better, just sort of incrementally got worse. And on the 27th of March, around 11 o'clock, he came to me and said, I have to go to the hospital. I can't breathe. And of course, you know, having uh, the COVID thing going on, I said, oh my gosh, he's got COVID. Rushed him to the hospital. I was not admitted to come into the hospital with him. He was brought into the emergency room and treated in the emergency room. I sat in the parking lot with my phone waiting to hear what was going on. Come to find out, uh, I got a phone call from him and his voice was breaking up uh, that he had leukemia and that they were shipping him down immediately to Mass General Hospital in Boston uh, to, be, um, to be treated down there because of the very acute, uh, uh, acute pr presentation of his illness. Um, they brought him down to Mass General. It was, I, get, I had 10 minutes to go home and grab some of his personal items. I don't even know how I did that. Um, it was so upsetting. You know, my husband was 56 years old, uh, in tip top shape, wicked healthy eater, um, really amazing athlete. Um, and to have this come down, uh, you know, in the midst of this pandemic was just a huge blow. Um, and ironically, you know, the kind of cancer that he has, acute myeloid leukemia, is an environmentally triggered cancer. So this have really affected, you know, first my community, which um, you know, made me get involved. And then the state as a whole with the highest rates of some cancers in the nation. Uh, and then it came right to my own house and affected my, my family in such a way that was just really tragic. And for the next four to five weeks, he was in lockdown in Mass General Hospital undergoing really uh, aggressive chemotherapy to save his life. Every one of his organ systems shut down in, in secession. Uh, and uh, he, though, amazingly pulled through that. Um, and in the last few uh, months, he had a stem cell transplant because of the very rare nature of his mutations in the, in the leukemia. Uh, that was what the treatment required. Um, and we're hopeful that that will be the thing. But, you know, there is just entirely too much cancer in New Hampshire, entirely too much cancer in the nation. And when we know that there's ways that we can prevent at least a good portion of those cancers by lessening exposure to environmental toxins, you know, this has really come home to my family directly. I'm so uh, sorry. I'm so sorry. Um, I, I just want to touch on one thing. 
uh, when he was in the hospital, how were you connecting? How were you, were you allowed to visit? Were you on the phone? Was it a FaceTime? Tell right. me about how, what that was like. Well, I was not allowed in. He was in, uh, first he was in the ICU. Uh, he was put on a ventilator for 24 hours. So I, you know, I, at the very time when so many people were saying, why should I wear a mask? And they're still saying that now, um, there was a ventilator shortage and the physician said to us, it's a good thing that he got sick when he did, because if it had been a couple of days later, we wouldn't have had a ventilator for him. And what happened was, you know, he was admitted and then brought to ICU. And because of the situation, the nurses and the doctors were under extreme stress. I wasn't allowed in. So I had the nurses train his cell phone on him so that I could observe him on FaceTime. Mm. Um, and I had two telephones. One was trained on him 24 hours a day on his chest or on him to just because I was so worried about his extreme uh, situation. He, he, um, I've met my, he's very athletic. And he's very athletic. When did he turn 56? Uh, last in May, May, uh, May of this so, year. So he was 55. When yes. He hit, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow. So very young uh, to have such an acute case of, of leukemia. Um, mm -hmm. You know, generally this kind of leukemia, acute myeloid leukemia is an older man or older person's disease, not a 55 year old or 56 year old. But so, the fact that you had to FaceTime him through this whole process is heart wrenching for everybody and your boys, of course, that was yes. tough, really tough. Yeah. So I know I've been keeping um, you all in my thoughts and prayers, and, and it is, um, you know, it's really been a journey for you. And I think how ironic that here you are out there fighting cancer at every turn, working to lower risk for everyone at the same time, and continue to do so at the same time you know, your family was having this incredibly tough, tough time. So I'm certainly grateful for, for all your work. And, and I'm sorry that you've had to deal with this journey. But I know that your family is strong, you're strong. You know, this is something that you guys have been amazing at addressing and dealing with. And um, when I first heard the story, I wanted you to share it because I know there are other people that have not been able to get treatment or see their loved ones or, you know, their family's been really disconnected through, through, uh, through COVID, not just cancer, because we know cancer can blow up lives every day. Right. But the COVID is really oiled to the fire, right? It is. Absolutely. It is really, really um, tough. Um, how did you advocate for yourself? How did you best advocate for yourself? For people that might be watching this, are there things that you can share about this journey, about how your family helped themselves and got help? Well, you know, just trying to figure out a way around uh, how to be in touch with the care, you know, and the nurses at Mass General are just phenomenal. I, you know, I met them almost every other day with a few personal items because that was all I could do. They met me in the parking lot and many times they broke down and hugged me or wanted to hug. They couldn't hug me. I'm sorry. They wanted to hug me uh, because they um, this is not the way they are used to, you know, having families um, deal with such, uh, uh, you know, a terrible situation. So they felt horrible. Um, so I think, you know, we have to understand that all of the nurses and doctors are under extreme stress as well. And, and they're also trying to care for our loved ones. So it is, you know, a very stressful time for everyone, not just us. And we need to do what we can to prevent the transmission of COVID-19 in our communities so that we can, you know, lessen the burden on our healthcare workers that have to deal with all the things besides COVID um, all the time, like, you know, like my husband's cancer. So advocating for him was, you know, just in my way of, trying to develop as good as I could a relationship with his physicians, with their masks on. And that was a whole other thing. You know, you see uh, the physicians would maybe step into the room 
and they would be all suited up with their masks on and their Tyvek and their, you know, because they had to protect themselves. They were afraid to approach him because they weren't sure if the testing that said he was negative for COVID was really true or if they were not, in fact, negative. Um, so, you know, you had to sort of see the physicians with a little bit of their eyes um, coming through. And, you know, it was quite a long time uh, in the last month or two that I actually saw his physician on a telemedicine call. And I said, that's what you look like, <laughs> you know? So there is a very big disconnect uh, when this kind of thing happens. You know, these, kind of, these people are more used to, you know, touching people and being with them and looking and so at them. So are we as patients. Yes. We, as patients, we're more connected. And when we most need to be connected, we've been disconnected. Exactly. And it's brutal. It's yes. so brutal. Yes. So, you know, the best I could do is FaceTime. And I was, like I said, on it 24 seven, watching everything that was going on or trying to and try to figure out what was being said, you know, when there's a distance between the phone and physicians at the door, it was difficult to hear uh, what they were saying oftentimes or try to figure out how to advocate and not be, you know, making it more difficult for them, but really being a concerned uh, family member that was trying to advocate for their loved ones. So mm -hmm. it, it was a, a very big challenge. Um, it still is. I'm not allowed to go into any of his appointments still. They're all closed down still. So, um, you know, it is a pretty um, upsetting way to have to deal with something that's so tragic. Right. And now that as you're headed into the holidays, you have to be so careful with family. I know, I know your boys have worked overtime to keep everyone safe and, and you too. I mean, yeah. um, it's been, it's been a journey because you are out there serving the public. You've had to really do it from, from behind um, lucite walls of some sort. And, and that's made it very complicated um, because people connect with you. You know, yes. they, we see they connect with you on social media. You are typically do a lot of public speaking and a lot of outreach. So people are looking to you to help fill their bucket and resolve issues in some way at a time when you're juggling a lot of other things. So I'm so grateful for the work that you do. I know lots of people are grateful for the work you do. If there's a way that we can help you or you know of ways that we can get this message out, I really, I know your family's quite private and I really appreciate you sharing the story. Mike's agreeing to share his story and I know it's been really a tough journey, but I'm hoping other people will get help because of this story. We can better help people advocate for themselves. We can give them, um, you know, support in some level. So if they're navigating this cancer journey at the same time, you know, of COVID, it's really, really specialized. And, you know, I know that you fought all every day to get the right attention and uh, did everything you could to make sure your husband and boys received, you know, the best care and attention the family was getting and how lucky you were to have nurses that were so compassionate. And, you know, we were lucky that he was taken to one of the best treatment centers in, you know, in the, in the nation. Uh, right. And I know that there are others that are not as fortunate or don't receive that kind of care. So, I'm, you know, very. We see, we see how hard we have to work to get care yes. for ourselves and others. It makes me wonder how people who are alone, who are, you know, who have language barriers, who have, yes. you know, other hurdles that they have to deal with. I don't know how they ever do it. I just don't know how they do it. Yeah, I agree. Um, it, you know, anything um, that we can do. Um, to support you and your good work, please let us know. Um, we love everything that you do um, to help out less cancer. And we um, love the work that you're doing um, to uh, fight for your community and family members to make sure they don't have unnecessary and preventable risk in their community and water. And you really, I mean, how many cancer clusters did you have identified? Three? Well, it's the one uh, pediatric double cancer cluster in right. the seacoast. Yeah. Um, but there are very high rates of cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, New Hampshire has the highest rate of pediatric cancer in the nation, as well as the highest rate of breast, bladder, and esophageal cancer in the nation. Which and is so amazing because it's such a pristine-looking place. 
Well, it's a pristine place where industry has really had its way with um, New Hampshire, I think. I think, and we're starting to see the effects of that. So, you know, and it becomes- Talk a little bit about industry and some of the issues well, there. Some, uh, you know, there are, there's a history of landfills and Superfund sites in New Hampshire where, mm -hmm. uh, you know, industry has either brought their pollution to New Hampshire uh, and disposed of it here in ways that we now know is not acceptable or, you know, industry in New Hampshire has thrived by, you know, um, creating an economic base in some towns that are lower income. Uh, it, like for Southern New Hampshire in particular, there's a large industrial source of air emissions, which is contaminating a big portion of yeah. New Hampshire with PFAS chemicals um, and continues to this very day, uh, which we have been fighting to stop. So, uh, you know, I think, um, New Hampshire is a small state. It does appear to be pristine, but, you know, it has suffered um, from trying to make its way. Uh, to some of these I mean, That's what makes it so wicked. You know, I've been to your sea coast. I've seen the, the ocean. I've seen the mountains. So, so many places of beauty, but dangerous. Yes. Yeah. I mean, right? yeah. And, you know, the regulation and just, you know, trying to, you know, one of the things that when I was elected to the state house, you know, I just was shocked at the lack of attention to these things like bladder cancer. You know, we had known for 15 years that when the state of New Hampshire reduced the New Jersey's, I mean, New Jersey reduced their exposure in New Jersey to arsenic, their rate of bladder cancer now is about a 10th of what the state of New Hampshire's is. New Hampshire has the highest rate in the country. Uh, so my regulation actually matches, made them match that standard. So hopefully we'll see that rate reduced, but you know, it's, it's not, it, not only is it important in normal times uh, to lessen environmental exposure, to make sure that our immune systems are healthy and functioning appropriately, when we really see it is when this pandemic hit. And we're now starting to really understand that these background immunotoxicity effects and uh, cancer and all these things, these chronic illnesses that people suffer from environmental exposure makes them much more likely to have severe cases of COVID-19. So the worlds are colliding. Um, and so in the background, you know, every day we should be looking at ways to reduce environmental exposure, to reduce the rate of chronic disease and cancer. So the work, that's why the work you're doing all the time and have been doing is so important because when we get hit with a pandemic or we get hit with the flu, uh, those people will definitely suffer more serious effects from those illnesses if they well, have a background. One thing that you get so well and, and people have learned a little bit through uh, the COVID experience is that the tools for securing public health are different than the tools we get when we go to the emergency room or they're different when we visit our doctor. Tools for public health look like education. They look like policy. They look like public, you know, they look like best practices. So those are a little bit different and people have a hard time getting their head around that. They feel almost as if it's like a control issue, but it's not a control issue. It's a wellness issue, a health issue. And those are the tools that we've discovered, like simply wearing a mask. Right. It has worked so well to secure public health when people actually wear the mask. Right. Or, do you know what I'm saying? Yes, so, absolutely. So there, it's really been an interesting time to showcase how securing public health can can work, and it can work this way for cancer too. I mean, we still lose, you know, several hundred thousand people to cigarette smoking. We still, you know, despite having all the information we have, we still have great unnecessary and preventable loss. And we know that, you know, in, in, in earlier times, it was all about beat cancer, cure cancer. Whether, you, whether you've gotten through the cancer battle or not, you're wounded. <laughs> Yeah, and you know that firsthand. Everything right. gets wounded: economic, yeah. health, everything. Families get for you know lots of things happen when people get sick. And if we can prevent it, I think we should. And you have really been a great leader in that arena, and we're very grateful for that work. I pray uh, your family gets through this quickly, and you know anything that I can do to help, please let me know. And um, I'm really grateful for your time today. I know we've gone way over the time limit, but you're such an interesting person to talk to. And I'm really grateful for you being here today. 
Thank you so much. I am so grateful for everything you do every day. Bill. It's Thank amazing you. and less cancer and uh, happy to be a part of this. Um, happy to be able to help spread the word. And thank you so much. Great. Thanks for all your work. Thank Take you. Yeah. Bye-bye.